Secrets. Something that is kept or meant to be kept unknown or unseen by others. And yet, despite its name, Atelier's secret trilogy focused on journeys of Rizal and Stout are anything but obscure. As recent as mid-March 2023, the subseries had sold a combined total of 1.6 million units worldwide, making it by far and away the best-selling collection within the Atelier series. And that was even before the release of its third title, Atelier Rise of Free, Alchemist of the End and The Secret Key. The game released on March 22nd, 2023 for PS4, PS5, Switch and and PC. And as I often do, I chose to play on PC, which is my preferred platform when available, and I also was playing on version 1.00, so bear in mind that some issues I mention here could have since been patched out. The PC version in of itself offers a fair number of options like anti-aliasing, a cap of 120 FPS, various controller layouts, and a host of other niche settings to play around with, encompassing both lower and higher end systems. As was the case for the previous two reviews, I have indeed finished the game, clocking in around 42 hours for my playthrough, which is around the same time it took for the other games. And I will say there will be minor spoilers for the first hour or so of the game to set up context for discussion points. Touted as the final journey for Riser and the Kirken Island crew, let's jump in and see if this wondrous adventure ends on a high note. The game begins as most Atelier games do, with a small excerpt of exposition by the game's heroine, in this case Ryza. She's reminiscing about her past adventures, but clearly she needs to work on her delivery, for the fuzzy fauna doesn't take too kindly to her stories. Fortunately, her backup crew in Tau and Boss help her out, paving the way for the player to take control for a battle. Okay, I guess we'll start with that then. If you've played the second game in the trilogy, then this battle system will feel very familiar. You have up to three party members on the front line and you take active control of one. You can also switch control to the other members with the left and right triggers. Referencing an Xbox series controller here, B is for normal attacks, Y is guard, X are items, and A is run away. If you press and hold the right bumper, you can access your skills, which proceed in a chain dependent on your AP pool. And if you hold the left trigger, you can switch out your control member with a support member. You can also use the D-pad to shift the party between a support and aggressive mode. As in previous iterations, action orders return and contribute to your tactics level, ensuring that the battle proceeds faster the longer it goes on, opening up larger AP maximums, extending normal attack chains, and yielding some additional abilities. One such ability is the Order Drive. Action orders will accumulate points, allowing you to use these abilities while a max tactics level allows a Fatal Drive, which boots the level back to one, but un unleashes a heavy hitting attack. It's no surprise then that since it borrows massively from Atelier Riser 2, which I heavily favoured, that I feel the same way about Riser Freeze battle system. It's still as slick as ever and allows for some great looking combos, not to mention giving a surprising amount of control to the player despite how fast paced it is. It would be a disservice though to say that Riser Freeze combat is a carbon copy of its predecessor, for the main difference comes in the use of keys. These are created by imbuing hollow moulds with powers, which you can find either at landmarks or through fighting enemies themselves, and they assist you in a multitude of ways. In the case of combat, the keys generally buff your abilities and allow for faster normal attack chains, meaning you can build up AP faster. To do this, you access the items menu and press the right bumper, giving you a list of choices on Ryza's keychains. On the other hand, you can also create keys using enemies as a medium. If you press the left bumper, you'll have a percentage based chance of making a brand new key for your collection, and naturally this means you get plenty of opportunities to build up your arsenal. This is a good addition overall, the base of combat was already enjoyable and as a result not much was needed to freshen it up. So a small change like this, which adds a little more to the experience but also sets Riser Free apart from contemporaries, was the best approach for Gust to take. However, as said before, keys are not limited to combat alone, they can be used for a multitude of other purposes. For instance, they can open barred off areas while exploring or add boons to your gathering like a higher chance of picking up high quality ingredients. Some can be equipped to the characters themselves and as you would expect, you can also use them in alchemy. Now just like combat, Alchemy and Atelier Riser 3 will look very similar if you've played the previous two games. Material loots are illustrated as nodes, and if you fulfil the requirements of the node, you gain the effect for the finished item. However, the ingredients you can add into a single synthesis are limited, so it's up to you to choose how you'll build the item. Riser 3 also sees the return of convenient systems like item duplication and item rebuilding, while also introducing new elements like link morphing, which is a method to change certain characters 
characteristics of an item. Many of these mechanics are locked on the skill tree, which also returns from Italio Riser 2. Progression in alchemy is pretty much entirely linked to this tree. Skill points, or SP, are earned through quests and alchemy, and the more you unlock, the deeper the core of alchemy becomes. It works well and gives you the choice of how you want to play, though there's no doubt some unlockables are way more important than others, like the aforementioned item rebuilding, staff gathering levels, and max quality upgrades. As for the use of keys, every recipe has certain criteria attached to them. The keys can fulfil these criteria up to a max of three, and they add bonuses like increasing the quantity made or allowing you to add more materials to a single synthesis. This is, once again, a small addition, but a positive one overall. The alchemy system specific to the earlier Riser games was already a strong core component, and it's clear that Gust chose to stick mostly on board with what worked before. Soon after this battle, Ryza hears a mysterious voice in her head. Wrong trilogy, but paying it no mind for now, she returns to her village with Tau and Bolse. After a thrilling exchange of words, Agatha alerts the group that islands have suddenly appeared at the nearby lake. These appearances have caused Kirken Island to become destabilised both geographically and economically, and Ryza knows that the three of them alone won't be able to handle this. With swift fire, she sends a letter off post-haste to Claudia and Lent for their assistance. With the objective now clear, she opens the door and so begins the final- Oh god my eyes! What is this? Why is it so blurry? Right, let's go over the technical issues. When the game first released, for the sake of my eyes and sanity, I had to turn off the bloom and the depth of field option. It was virtually unplayable otherwise. I have no idea what the developers were going for here. Is Riser now short-sighted? Is that what's going on? I mean, forget the developers. How did the playtesters think this was okay? It's horrible to look at. Thankfully, like I say, you can turn those options off and get the presentation back to normality. Since we're mentioning technical issues like this, you'll notice other small issues with the game too. It was clear that Gust were struggling for time near the end of development, and it lacks quite a bit of polish in some respects. There's consistent grammar and spelling issues, wooden translation at points, and a host of bad textures. Now, like I said before, these may have been patched out, but I choose to stick with the version that I bought the game with, at least for review purposes. And this one had a host of frayed edges, though not enough to completely ruin the experience. Eventually, Riser is joined up by two more of the OGs, Claudia and Lent, and they start to make their way to the Kark Isles, the culprit of the people's woes and the focus for much of this journey, narratively speaking. And it's here where Gust open up the world as you make the long trek to see it for yourselves. Opening up that map, you realise how big it really is. Although Riser 3 is split into distinctive zones, each one in of itself is massive. They rival Atelier Theorists in size at times. But its size ensures there's plenty to find off the beaten path. You'll find unique ingredients specific to the region, hidden areas, and treasure chests. For example, as I was going around this cave, I found... Uh? Yeah, this will be a good time to talk about quests. Rise of Free has a few categories for these, those being normal quests that you find interacting with NPCs, character quests specific to the group, and these so-called random quests, which trigger as you traverse the world. Now, while I like the idea, I think they pop up far too often, and the objective is rudimentary in many cases. Pick up sparkling materials, kill some enemies, and the reward is never really worth it. More often than not, they just got in the way, and by the end, I was running right past them as they weren't worth the time. However, all of the other quests were worth the time, especially the world quests. World quests are fairly infrequent, but they are specific to each zone, and upon completing the chain of objectives, they often affect the world around you in some way. You see tangible effects for your efforts, and that's always a positive in my books. And this is a key theme of Atelier Rise of Free. In many cases, those willing to explore are rewarded heavily for their endeavour, whether it be through quests or the items they find. And though I like this approach, it does act as a double-edged sword in some ways. The prevailing critique is that Atelier Riser 3 has been touted as the easiest game in the trilogy, and it mostly stems from these large maps. You see, the deeper you go into the zones, the more dangerous the enemies become, but with risk comes reward, and these deeper areas are teeming with decent quality materials that themselves hold high-level traits. Now, enemies would normally be a deterrent to this, but because there's no random encounters, you can just pick up materials by the bucket load and just avoid the enemies around you. They're spread out 
out sparsely enough that you can easily dodge around them. As a result, you can easily acquire the high-end traits at a very early stage. And as Atelier games so often champion, it's not the level of the equipment that is important, it's how and what you make it with. By the time I got to the 10 hour mark, I had all of the equipment I needed to see me through to the end of the game. I still had small issues in the later areas, which required the odd tweak here and there, but for the most part, I was sorted. Yet, the fact I still had problems in the later parts of the game makes me believe that it wasn't the game itself that was easy, the difficulty curve is still there. Rather, it's just that the game is easy to break. Because these high level traits are available to you so early on, if you understand the system and mechanics on offer as Atelier so often requires, you can coast through the game if you really want to. And that's the key word there, if you want to. Player choice takes the forefront once again. If you want to proceed for the thrill of challenge, you can do that. If you want to stomp, you can do that too. Now obviously, I opted for the latter as I'm a fan of making busted equipment, but as a result of this early spike in gear, I spent a lot less time crafting in Rise of Free. Whereas in, say, Atelier Sophie 2, I spent around 40% of my time crafting, in this game I did about half that because I had everything I needed within the first third of the game. So that begs the question, if I spent less time crafting in Rise of Free, why was my completion time similar to the other titles? Well, that segues us nicely to the story. Atelier Rise of Free was clearly aiming to end the Grand Manor while also giving us an adequate farewell to the group. In terms of the characters, it achieves that mostly through its aforementioned character quests, which are optional events delving in more to the individuals from a number of perspectives, whether they be humorous or solidifying the traits we already know. Some events, however, are so important to their arcs that they're put into the main story, and many of the ones that are shown are justified in being mandatory. Due to this, I was a big fan of Boss's story and its events conclusion. But because of this approach, it feels at times that Atelier Rise of Free has bitten off more than it can chew, as if it's attempting to put too many things into a box that's clearly too small. The previous two games left plenty of plot points and character arcs open, they lacked a conclusion and left it to Rise of Free to round out. The challenge that this game faced is it had to contend with ending those well, while also giving ample time to the new members to allow them to shine as well. There's no doubt these new characters do get a decent allocation of time to shine in their own ways, and they are good, but since they had only a segment of one game to endear themselves to me, I didn't relate to them nearly as much as the returning cast. I had far more of an affinity to the original characters, the likes of Lent, Boss, Tao, Riser, and Claudia, characters who I had witnessed the growth of and was now finally seeing their coming of age, so to speak. For example, it was clear early on how the likes of Lent had matured as he returned home to see his estranged father, or how Bolse continued Tended with one day taking over as the head of the Brunen family, and all the responsibilities that came with that. I personally would have liked more focus on these, on the character arcs I was already invested in because I think it would have aided massively in the game's overall flow. Because of the large cast and the need to round them all off narratively along with the overarching plot, Rise of Free suffers mostly in its pacing, especially in the final third. It feels like it's meandering after a certain point. The core mystery history is still there, it's still the objective, but you're taking baby steps to get there. They feel so insignificant at points that you're wondering if you're making any progress at all. Jumping between lands, fulfilling arbitrary tasks just to get items that feed into the final solutions, this part could have had 4-5 to five hours cut off easily in my opinion, and still delivered on the major premise in a satisfying manner. Despite that though, I do concede that the finale was very well done. The moments leading up to that final goodbye were heartwarming in many ways, yet also bittersweet. And that in of itself was the true message of this game, that summers of bliss and adventures do not last forever. We all grow up and have to make our own difficult choices, but it's about how we face them that defines who we eventually become. While I wouldn't say Atelier Rise of Free is my favourite game in the trilogy due to a collection of minor issues, especially on the story front, it is without doubt a brilliant game and a satisfactory farewell to the trilogy. It once again shines in the likes of its core alchemy system, its combat and its focus on exploration, with the new additions like the keys being a welcome element to freshen up the game. It did what it needed to do and it did it very well in many cases, and who knows, it might even go down the Arland and Mysterious routes in the future by giving us one final entry for good measure. 
But for now, we close the chapter on the story of the Secret Trilogy. It was without doubt a memorable summer. It was without doubt a memorable adventure. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please like and subscribe for more JRPG content and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace.